NRC committee, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so then, so your lead author for, for the IPCC, this is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for the non-climate students in the class. Yeah, which is the the for, they're, they're all the students in the class. Essentially every four years or so, all the climate researchers in the world and econom economists and other people focused on the uh, causes and impacts of climate change get together and write a massive set of reports on what's, what's happening, uh, what might be causing it, and what should we do about it potentially. And that's a massive amount of work. So wh what in the world are you doing like on YouTube? Um, so I mean, that's a good question. Um, but you know, I, I think just because of the nature of my work, uh, I end up in kind of in the, in the public sphere, um, relatively frequently. And, and as, as my career has developed, I've ended up in the public sphere more frequently. So you're talking, getting, getting questions from the media, um, getting contacted by, uh, elected officials, you know, offices, offices of, Congress people, governors, that kind of thing, um, and uh, now with the blogosphere, uh, you know, there it's a lot. Um, uh, information that's published in the peer-reviewed literature ends up in the blogosphere, uh, you know, in a way that that is different than um, prior to the blogosphere. Obviously, I mean, that's because that's. That's uh, tautological, but uh, it's very different, you know, in terms of the what the, the scientific information that's in the peer-reviewed literature, how it ends up in the public discussion is different now that, that the blogosphere exists and, and certainly is different now than it was five years ago in my experience. So um, why am I on YouTube? Why am I doing Hangouts on Air with people from all over the world, whoever they are? I may not even know who they are until, you know, halfway through the Hangout and they pop up in the, in the screen. Um, you know, I think that because I, you know, I, I have been doing so much communication by virtue of kind of the, the kind of, of science that I do, um, I've found that this is a way to really kind of be proactive about that communication. And it's a medium that's different in my experience. Um, you know, being able to just um, – sit almost face to face and and have a conversation and have it with people from all over the world at once um, is a is a much more dynamic rich uh, form of communication than um, any of the other ones that, that I've experienced and I still that doesn't mean that I don't um, I don't respond to, to the other kinds of questions but I think that um, I it's I'm doing it anyway and 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 it's uh, it's exciting to be able to do something different and explore what the possibilities are. And I think, you know, in the U S our and, and certainly in other countries, but here I am in the U S you know, our, our research, um, enterprise is, is really heavily supported by the public. And I feel, you know, given, given the taxpayer support of my research program, I feel like I have a responsibility to communicate what we know, what we don't know and, and try to help people understand. So it's an extension of the, the teaching that we do at the university. So, um, although, you know, what's interesting, it, having written about climate all these years, it's become such a policy-relevant, news-relevant subject. You know, if you were an anthropologist, you might not be getting as much of that interactivity, but, but you're in a realm where you're just kind of in the spotlight. Yeah, there's something, um, yeah, I mean, even like, you know, university, um, maybe any university right now, but certainly the universities that I've been at, you know, that have fantastic um, faculty and, and postdocs and students in, in so many areas, uh, the climate and the environment are really, um, you know, heavily, there's a lot of heavy interest, uh, you know, even um, just in those topics, even where you have, you know, really, really high quality scholars across the board. Um, so our Institute for the Environment here, at Stanford, you know, there's certainly a lot of um, a lot of very relevant work going on climate and 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 other environmental work and and um, yeah, that's definitely in in the public discussion in a way that that some other some other areas aren't. Um, so I, I think that's I think that's a lot of it. You know, is just that that that's the time that that we're living in, and and right. um, I think those of us who are working on it at this time while we're living in this time have a 
you know, I, I personally, I feel I have a responsibility to try to help people understand what, you know, what we're doing. Has there been a particular, um, whether it was Hurricane, um, so I was going to say Katrina, Sandy, whether it was Sandy or um, the heat wave, um, was there any particular subject you've covered so far on your Google broadcasts that you think got the most attention or uh, that you think went, went, went best? Um, yeah, so it's interesting because, um, you know, it's really, it's kind of the Wild West a little bit. I mean, it's very, it's very pioneer, kind of open, a lot of open niche space and, you know, we'll just kind of, hey, try that. Um, so I think, um, I, I think there are a couple aspects to that uh, and how you measure success or what worked or didn't depends on, um, you have different metrics, but you know, I think for, in terms of, you um, just trying to help the public understand science and how we do science, the process of science, institution of the science, what are the details of the science that we do studying the climate system. A lot of the science communication, and in my experience, the vast majority of the science communication is around um, new science that uh, in many cases, the, the entire scientific community hasn't seen yet at the time that the reporter is contacting right. the scientists. Like, you know, two or three peer reviewers and an editor basically have seen it. And, and now, you know, we're trying to communicate that with the public. Um, so the, the point is just a lot of what we communicate is very, very new uh, because that's where the, a lot of the public interest is, is what's this new paper that just came out. Um, and so I think that the Hangouts have helped to that communication and it's been with just a few people. Right. So like they're in terms of the measurable impact, well, it's just a few people, but we're having, we're able to have a dialogue, you know, and I can pull up, you know, I can screen share figures from the paper and, you know, we can have a dialogue about that brand new science that, and that's just not possible in, um, you know, any other kind of conventional format. Right. Um, sometimes you're, you know, you know, 30 seconds of, Hey, what's new about this paper? Now you're live or whatever. Um, so that's one area where, you know, it's maybe it's impacted six people in the world, but in a very different, sure. uh, more deep way in terms of the understanding. I think that certainly there has been a lot of interest in the current events. That's for sure. Um, so Sandy was definitely, um, there was a lot of interest in that one. Um, the heat wave, heat wave drought fires, you know, we did, we did one this summer that was, um, that uh, was actually had, uh, Marty Horling and Harold Brooks are both uh, scientists with, with NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, uh, different labs, and they were both in. And um, and so that's certainly the one that's been viewed on YouTube the most number of times. Um, so that that's some metric that some people use. Um, although in that one, there wasn't anyone in the public that was in the Hangout, right? So it was a different, that's a very different, kind of use where you have people, you know, that's, that's much more going to hear the people who are the experts or whatever, and they're talking and then other people are consuming that discussion, which is very different than, than the technology enabling that, the right. enabling the discussion. Um, the one that fell basically entirely flat, uh, <laughs> was the one where I was invited to, um, speak at the Heartland Institute climate conference. And I was, you know, physically unable to be there given my schedule when the invitation came with, you know, it's, it was in late May and, you know, we have the quarter and dissertation defenses and qualifying exams and all that. And I just wasn't physically able to be in Chicago. And I said, Hey, I'm, I'm willing to do this. I accept your invitation. I want to have this discussion and I can't do it in the room. Let's do a hangout on air and we can have this discussion. And that, my invitation for that uh, was not accepted, and so I, um, I said, "Well, just hey. for context, uh, this is a group that is a libertarian, anti-regulatory, conservative group that is trying to cast doubt on the seriousness of climate change, and they have an annual conference. Um, it's basically a conference that was aimed at at highlighting doubt uh, and obscuring the stuff that's n well established. So it was really gutsy of Noah to." agree or, or to want to engage. And I, I agree with you on the need for engagement, even with um, tough, uh, even adversarial uh, audiences on this. So 
Um, so it didn't go. It didn't actually work out. Well, so yeah. So the so my invitation fell flat, and then I I said, great. Well, okay. So you're not. You know, you they're responsible. We don't have video capability from the venue. Um, although incidentally, they did stream the the talks online. You could watch them online. So. Um, at any rate, I, I said, all right, well, fine. We'll, I'll go ahead and have this discussion anyways with whoever wants to show up. And I did it during the conference, essentially the time slot that I would have been in Chicago that I would have had. And, um, and I, you know, put it out as a, you know, basically a, you know, a very, um, friendly invitation request for, um, skeptics to let's have a conversation and, and, um, no skeptics joined <laughs> and very few others joined. So, you know, I don't know what the, maybe the time of day was wrong or whatever, but that, right, that, right. that it's interesting that, 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 um, that's kind of the, the counter example in terms of the answer of what worked, uh, or what has worked, or what's had, what's had uptake. Um, well, this gets back to something you said at the beginning, which was, uh, this is all kind of an open arena and, Essentially, anything's possible if you can think of it. So, this gets to. I'd love you for you to explore a little bit your sense of what we're looking at here with this capability. Um, do you see this spilling into um, the more technical stuff, like you finding people to collaborate with, or, or you know, before the paper is done? In other words, when you're starting to think about doing research, um, or even co-teaching with someone in, in Shanghai or whatever. Uh, what do you see as the frontiers here, as the potential, now that you've kind of played around a little bit? Um, well, in education, I think there's a lot of potential. And, um, you know, there's certainly, I'm involved with this in discussions about how we can, you know, have a class where you have experts from all over the, the world who are doing it like this, like we're doing now, basically, that are able to join the class. And, you know, one of the things that this particular technology enables, um, you know, is the ability to have multiple people from around the world. So you could bring multiple experts together for a discussion where um, it's expensive to, you know, fly everybody to one campus. Um, it's very difficult to schedule a full trip from around the world for nine experts, but to schedule an hour of nine experts at the same time is easier. Um, and it's much more exclusive um, to have to get everybody in one room and have the have that intellectual exchange be confined to that room, and so I think there are potential benefits not only in cost and environmental impact of international travel and um, and ease of scheduling, but also in terms of um, the accessibility and certainly a, you know the in the education arena, um, the kind of online education is a real uh, current. Topic is certainly one at Stanford. That's a very current topic, uh, and that Stanford is is on top of um, right, the MOOC craze. Exactly. Yeah. So the MOOC um, massively online. Uh, yeah, it's like massive, massive open online classes, or right. those might be switched. But so whether or not you could have a MOOC that's in this kind of format, maybe um, one hundred twenty-five thousand. Know, <laughs> I don't know if you have that many people hanging right. out at once, but I think certainly. Um, there are a lot of ways in which, in which, you know, just this can enable educational possibilities. Um, in terms of collaboration, um, absolutely. And you know, I have I have people I've co-authored with multiple papers who I've never met in person. You know, we've done that by phone and email and all that. But this, you know, just like it enables a more rich communication of science with the public. It, you know, same with collaborators. Um, and I have a project now where we're where we use you know we they're not on air but we do we, we use hangouts to you know three of us in three different three different locations and we're able to um we're able to have a video conference to you know and, and the screen share and file share and all that um and I, I think so I think that's that's maybe a general technological um phenomenon in terms of the progress of science that I think you know, technology is enabling collaboration in a lot of ways, and and I think we shouldn't, we certainly shouldn't underrate the benefits of being able to talk to each other in, in enabling collaboration. Uh, you know, it's not just that we can send files electronically or something like that. I mean, the fact that you can actually interact uh, makes a big difference. In the in the public hangouts you've done, um, one thing that people I, I 
don't appreciate or haven't absorbed it sometimes about the, the kind of blogging that I try to do is that I'm, I use it as a learning tool. I mean, I, basically my blog, I'm not there to sort of trumpet to the world everything I know, but to explore things in an open source kind of way. And um, do you find that these sessions, obviously part of it is you clarifying for average uh, citizens, you know, what some aspect of science means, but are you learning at the same time? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are concrete examples even where, I mean, I think we're always, we're always learning from, you know, you kind of rub up against people and ideas and, you, you know, it, it's stimulating. But there are definitely concrete examples. There was, um, had a paper come out this spring um, and, and uh, I, I did, a, did a Hangouts on Air and a couple people showed up and I was doing the screen share and we were, you know, I was trying to explain what we'd done and showing the results and, and whatnot. And one of, the, one of the people in the Hangouts said, well, um, you know, why don't you just, why, why didn't you guys, uh, you know, test this, this sensitivity? So, wow, that's a great idea. We should do that. Like, I mean, literally, like, you know, it, it was a great suggestion. And, you know, that's, you know, that's one really, really concrete example. But um, there are a lot of smart people out there. And, you know, not all of them are working on climate, it turns out. Um, but a lot of them are interested. In, and um, so, yeah, I think that that, it's the same as, you know, when I give public talks and, um, or talk to the media, um, I think, like, there's some, um, you know, I, I've, there's this, there's this question of the new normal that gets asked a lot, or gets, that phrase gets used a lot, yeah. and, um, you know, published a number of, of papers on, on climate extremes and, and extreme heat in particular, and, and I just, kept getting asked this question by, by the media and also by, by, you know, relatives at Thanksgiving or whatever, you know, that, well, so, so is this the new normal? Does this mean this is the new normal? And I kept saying, well, no, we really haven't, we, we can't say it's the new normal. We really haven't looked at it in that way. That's not the analysis that we've done. We can't draw that conclusion. And finally, I, you know, just getting asked this by the public so much that I said, fine, let's, let's actually go and try to answer that question scientifically. And so we, we literally went and just said, let's find when the new normal emerges. Let's go, let's ask that question. If that, that seems to be an interesting question. And, and it turned out to be a really interesting first paper. And now we're, we've got another one in the works. And actually, we'll have a presentation at, at the AGU meeting next week on the new, you know, the new, new normal. And all. I mean, so it's, <laughs> yeah, I think that, you know, I've, um, I've benefited a lot from, uh -huh. from interacting with, with the public. I, you know, not, not just kind of in the, intangible way, but, but there have been a lot of tangible benefits. If you could email me the, the link. So there was one paper, paper that's already out, you said, as a result of that? Yeah, that? yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, um, uh, in 2011. Okay. Um, when, when did you start doing the Hangouts, by the way? How, how long ago? You must have been a very early adopter. Yeah, so I was on the, I, I, was, I was on the white list, I guess is what they called it. Um, right. So I guess blacklist that has some negative connotation, I don't know, <laughs> so they call it a whitelist, but yeah, so I was on the, um, I was able to do them a little bit before they were, they were publicly available, right. um, so I think my first one was April 6th, actually, 2012, so I haven't, uh, it's been about six months, I guess, a little more than six months, um, yeah, how so many, yeah. how many have you done, roughly? roughly, um, I bet I've done, on the order of 10, probably, I mean, I've, I've done, Depending on the on the period, sometimes you know it's every couple of weeks, and sometimes it's one a month. Um, so something somewhere around there. But you know, I, it's interesting because there's there's kind of this hangouts community that's developing, and so I've you know I've done some where I've been a guest on other people's hangouts on air, and and that's kind of brought me into contact with a different community, you know, different a different slice. Um, that's been interesting, and and um, and you know I keep. I, with the with the conventional media, I keep saying, "Hey, you know, we could we could also try this hangouts on air." And um, you know, after I do the radio interview, or I say, "Hey, we, you know, you want to do a radio interview? Let's do a simulcast. We could do it as a hangout also." And you know, there's definitely um, some inertia in the, oh, in, yeah. at least in my experience. But it hasn't been a lot. Oh, of no, it's not just you. Really. Media. <laughs> so you think that this is kind of. Uh, this is part of the post-media approach to communication. I mean, one of the things that I've 
when I speak about this stuff, I say basically conventional media is a shrinking wedge of an explosively growing pie of ways to tell stories, ways to communicate, uh, share ideas, shape ideas. So why worry too much about what's going on in that wedge? Right. <laughs> it, it, I mean, obviously it matters still, um, but you're sort of demonstrating that it's not the only way to have meaningful um, societal interaction. Yeah, and I think the you know, getting back to the metrics of success, right? Like that um, there are some conventional ways of measuring success and some of them have, have kind of bled into the new ways of communicating, right? So like Nielsen ratings have somehow been, you know, kind of translated into YouTube uh, views or reshares, retweets. Or, I mean, so there's like there's... There's something about volume that we tend to, you know, kind of scale success by by the volume. Use that as a yardstick. You know, the more viewers, the more retweets, the more YouTube views, or whatever. Um, but I'm not convinced that 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 in terms of understanding that we get more increase in understanding just from the most number of retweet retweets or whatever. Um, and there's certainly a lot of a lot of kind of echo chamber um, phenomena in the in the blogosphere, at least in my the the ways that I've observed it. And I guess I'd rather have a deep, detailed conversation with a few people than you know a have a blurb you know get three hundred comments or whatever, um, in terms of my, just my, my communication, you know, I'll keep, I'll keep answering questions when I'm asked, of course, but in terms of, you know, I'm not, I didn't start a blog, like I, in fact, I have heavily resisted, like I haven't, you know, I've, I'm, I'm not on, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not, I, I okay, so class is blogging the, sorry. Um, no, 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 <laughs> that's okay, <laughs> not for everybody. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not against blogs, it's just that, like, there are blogs, Already, right? There already are blogs, and I and and in, in climate in particular, that kind of has. Um, I mean, you mentioned you kind of you distinguish what your you know your blog kind of how you envision it, what you intend it to be, and the fact that 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 you the fact that you do have to distinguish. Well, it's not just about climate because there are so many like this whole industry of right. the climate blogosphere, right? And um, so I I wouldn't have. I didn't ever take the opportunity to start doing that, right? I didn't see that as being um, kind of the incremental benefit either to me or to society as really being in that area just because it's it's kind of evolved into its own its own thing and this is this is something that's potentially new. Um, well it certainly is new and there's if yeah. there's the potential for it to have new new kinds of impact. One student here, uh, Olivia over here. Yeah, she's doing a video blog, a blog. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, so her blog is all on video. Uh, there is a portal. There's a home base for it on uh, with the WordPress blog as well. But it's uh, video reports. It essentially she's exploring the um, the upside of web video. So much of web video is people falling down and you know yeah. being idiots <laughs> onto cats or whatever. Right, right, exactly. Always onto cats. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so she, uh, Olivia, is trying to sort of uh, find the uh, the upside of stuff, which is really cool. Just so you know, uh, Lou Guarneri over my shoulder here is his blog is fine tuning, and it's about music, uh, music, music, and musicians that are making the world a better place. Some cool. fascinating stuff. Actually, he just in a, in a post today he uh, mentioned uh, auto tuning. Uh, <laughs> you probably saw the Al Gore auto tune. I'd I am a there's a I'm a very brief cameo in the Al Gore. Oh, you are. Oh. If you don't blink. If okay. you don't blink, you'll uh, you'll see a couple of quick shots of me. Right. You were part of you were you were involved with the 24 hours uh, thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Last year and this year. So I think it. I think the one that the Symphony of Science or whatever did was from last year's and. Um, right. 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 And but you Zane, really got You really got to make sure you don't blink. Got it. Okay. <laughs> and Zainab uh, here is. Uh, She's doing a blog on bloggers, and one of one of during Sandy or right after Sandy, one of the blogs uh, she wrote about was uh, was it by a scientist? It was it was a blog. It was a sci I, what was his name? Do you remember? I can't remember. He did a blog from that was basically the the voice of Sandy. It was like a Sandy <laughs> I view 
of Hurricane Sandy's impact. Here I come. <laughs> yeah. What was the name of it? I don't remember. Maybe you could look it up. Yeah, if you can remember. I'm just curious because I, I, I remember the name of the, the scientist. I, anyway, so we're we're all involved in different aspects of this. Uh, way in the back, uh, Ashley Dandridge is uh, doing a blog on on visualization. What's it called? Hurricane Sandy Speaks dot com. Hurricane Sandy Speaks dot com. Oh yeah. So I'll check it out. <laughs> <laughs> so we're an interesting uh, interesting bunch this year. This is the second year for this course and. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of an experiment, just like you were saying. Um, there's no textbook. We, we the one book that we have that the students read is by um, uh, Scott Rosenberg, who um, he was one of the founders of Salon.com, uh -huh. and he wrote a book called "Say Everything." That's essentially a short history of blogging. It starts in uh, like 1995 or so. So, um, so this whole arena is so new, whether it's blogs or YouTube. Um, that it's kind of exciting. I assume that's why you're partially why you're you're here. Oh yeah, no, I I think um, yeah, I'm definitely a sucker for for new, for sure. Right? Like I get I think um, yeah, I, I I think just the opportunity to have that creative edge, um, like I say, for something that I'm doing anyways, to kind of find the creative edge, and um, that's a that's a huge, a huge part of it for me. Um, and we, you know, we try to do that with our science, try to do that with our kind of conventional teaching in the, in the classroom. And this is an opportunity to kind of have some, have some, uh, control. Whoops. Oh, that was weird. We lost him. Noel is gone. Noel is gone. Um, let me see if I can get him back. Otherwise we'll end it. Well, we uh, may have lost, that may be the end of this broadcast, the first uh, broadcast of Pace University's Blogging a Better Planet course, and there will be more, and we will thank uh, Noah Diffenbaugh from Stanford University for visiting with us. And uh, again, it's all a big experiment.